The History of the Chantry, Chapter 1 through 4. Chapter 1 The Imperium in Flames. The first blight devastated the Deventer Imperium. Not only had the Darkspawn ravaged the countryside, but Deventer cities had to face the fact that their own gods had turned against them. Dumat, the old god once known as the Dragon of Silence, had risen to silence the world, and despite the frenzied pleas for help, the other old gods did nothing. The people of the Imperium began to question their faith, murdering priests and burning temples to punish their gods for not returning to help. In those days, even after the devastation of the First Blight, the Imperium stretched across the known world. Fringed with barbarian tribes, the Imperium was well prepared for invasions and attacks from without. Fitting, then, that the story of its downfall begins from within. The people of the far northern and eastern reaches of the Imperium rose up against the powerful overlords in rebellion. The Deventer Magister summoned demons to put down those small rebellions, leaving corpses to burn as examples to all who dare revolt. The Imperium began to tear itself apart from within, throngs of angry and disillusioned citizens doing what centuries of opposing armies could not. But the Magisters were confident in their power, and they could not imagine surviving a blight only to be destroyed by their own subjects. Even after the Blight, Tevinter commanded an army larger than that of any other organized nation in Thetis. But that army was scattered and its morale dwindling. The ruin of Tevinter was such that the Alamari barbarians, who had spread their clans and holds over the wilderness of the Ferelden Valley at the far southeast edge of the Imperium, saw weakness in their enemy, and after an age of oppression, embarked on a campaign not only to free their own lands, but to bring down mighty Tevinter as well. The leaders of that blessed campaign were the great barbarian warlord Maferath and his wife Andraste. Their dreams and ambitions would change the world forever. From Tales of the Destruction of Thetis by Brother Genitivi, Chantry Scholar. Chapter 2 A Prophet Born. When the prophet Andraste and her husband Maferath arrived at the head of their barbarian hordes, southern Tevinter was thrown into chaos. The Imperium had defended against invasions in the past, but now they stood without the protection of their gods, and their army in tatters and their country devastated by the Blight. Many felt that the timing of the invasion was yet another of the Maker's miracles in Andraste's campaign to spread his divine word. Andraste was more than simply the wife of a warlord. After all, she was also the betrothed of the Maker. Enraptured by the melodic sound of her voice as she sang to the heavens for guidance, the Maker himself appeared to Andraste and proposed that she come with him leaving behind the flaw world of humanity. In her wisdom, Andraste pleaded with the Maker to return to his people and create paradise in the world of men. The Maker agreed, but only if all the world would turn away from the worship of false gods and accept the Maker's divine commandments. Armed with the knowledge of one true god, Andraste began the exalted marches into the weakened Imperium. One of the Maker's commandments, that magic should serve man rather than rule over him, was as honey to the souls of the downtrodden of Tevinter who lived under the thumbs of the Magisters. Word of Andraste's exalted march, of her miracles and military successes, spread far and wide. Those in the Imperium who felt the old gods had abandoned them eagerly listened to the words of the Maker. Those throngs of restless citizens that destroyed temples now did so in the name of the Maker and his prophet Andraste. As Mafras' armies conquered the lands of southern Tevinter, so did Andraste's words conquer hearts. It is said that the Maker smiled on the world at the Battle of the Valerian Fields, in which the forces of Maferath challenged and defeated the greatest army Tevinter could muster. The southern reaches of the mighty Imperium now lay at the mercy of barbarians. Faith in the Maker, bolstered by such miracles, threatened to shake the foundations of the Imperium apart. Of course, the human heart is more powerful than the greatest weapon, and when wounded, it is capable of the blackest deeds. From Tales of Destruction of Thetis by Brother Genitivi, Chantry Scholar. Chapter 3 On the Betrayal of Andraste. It is said that at the Battle of Valerian Fields, Mafras stood and looked out over his armies. He had conquered the southern reaches of the greatest empire the world had ever known and built splintered barbarian clans into a force to be feared. With pride in his heart, he turned to congratulate his men and found that they had turned from him. Mafras fell to the evil of jealousy. After all that he had done, his wife was the one to receive all the glory. He saw his wife's power and influence and tired of his place as second husband, below the Maker. His heart swelled with fury. If he had conquered just to have his wife wrested from him by a forgotten god and a legion of faith-hungry rabble, then perhaps this war was not worth the trouble. Here, history and the chant of light come apart. 
History tells us that Mafras looked north into the central Imperium and saw nothing but more war against a rapidly regrouping army, and he despaired. The Chant of Light holds that Mafras chafed with jealousy of the Maker and jealousy of the glory that Andraste received, although it was he who led the armies. Mathrath traveled to the Imperium capital of Minrathus to speak with the Archon Isarian. There, he offered up his wife to the Imperium in return for a truce that would end hostilities once and for all. The Archon, eager to put down the voice of the prophet that stirred his own people against him, agreed. Mathrath led Andraste into an ambush where she was captured by Imperial agents, putting an end to her exalted march. Crowds of loyalists stood in the center square of Minrathus to watch Andraste's execution. By command of the Archon, she was burned at the stake in what the Imperium believed to be the most painful punishment imaginable. According to the Chantry, however, Andraste was instead purified and made whole by the flames, ascending to life at her Maker's side. By all accounts, there was only silence where they expected screams. At the sight of the Prophet burning, the crowds were filled with a profound guilt, as if they had participated in a great blasphemy. So moving was the moment that the Archon himself drew his sword and thrust it into the Prophet's heart, ending her torment and leaving those assembled to consider the weight of what they had seen. Whereas the execution of Andraste was meant to be a symbol of defeat for the faith of the Maker, in truth it all but sealed the faith of the worship of the old gods and paved the way for the spread of the Maker's chant. From Tales of the Destruction of Thetis by Brother Genitivi, Chantry Scholar. Chapter 4 on the birth of the Chantry. The crowds present at the death of Andraste were right to feel despair. It is believed that the prophet's execution angered the Maker, and he turned his back on humanity once more, leaving the people of Thetis to suffer in the dark. In these dark times, mankind scrambled for a light, any light. Some found comfort in demonic cults that promised power and riches in return for worship. Others prayed to the old gods for forgiveness, begging the great dragons to return to the world. Still, others fell so low as to worship the Darkspawn, forming vile cults dedicated to the exaltation of evil in its purest form. It is said that the world wept as its people begged for a savior who would not come. Andraste's followers, however, did not abandon her teachings when she died. The cult of Andraste rescued her sacred ashes from the courtyard in Manrathus after her execution, stealing them away to a secret temple. The location of the temple has long been lost, but the ashes of Andraste served as a symbol of the enduring nature of the faith in the Maker, that humanity could earn the Maker's forgiveness despite his grievous insult to him. With time, the cult of Andraste spread and grew, and the chant of light took form. Sing this chant in all four corners of Thetis, it was said, and the world would gain the Maker's attention at last. As the Chant of Light spread, the cult of Andraste became known as the Andrastean Chantry. Those who converted to the Chantry beliefs found it in their mission to spread Andraste's word. There were many converts, including powerful people in the Imperium and in the city-states of what is now Orlais. Such was the power of the Maker's word that the young King Draken undertook a series of exalted marches meant to unite the city-state and create an empire solely dedicated to the Maker's will. The Orlesian Empire became the seat of the Chantry's power, the Grand Cathedral in Val Rio, the source of the movement that birthed the organized Chantry as we know it today. Draken, by then Emperor Draken I, created the Circle of Magi, the Order of Templars, and the Holy Office of the Divine. Many within the Chantry revere him nearly as equal with Andraste herself. The modern Chantry is a thing of faith and beauty, but is also a house of necessity, protecting Thetis from powerful forces that would do it harm. Where the Grey Wardens protect the world from the Blight, the Chantry protects mankind from itself. Most of all, the Chantry works to earn the Maker's forgiveness, so that one day he will return and transform the world into the paradise it was always meant to be. From Tales of the Destruction of Thetis by Brother Genitivi, Chantry Scholar.